The this Sherwood conference will now be recorded. Okay, and now we're being recorded. So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us um, for an MBA Tech Tuesday that is not being held on a Tuesday, but uh, we're really excited to bring you um, this very interesting program. Um, just a, a couple of house items. If you could please remember to mute your, your, um, your microphone so that we can keep the, uh, the feedback down to a minimum. Um, and also, uh, we, hopefully we have some time at the end for some audience Q&A. So I would ask you to please, um, um, we're, we're getting some feedback. If we could get everybody to mute. Mute their phones, please. Um, and also for the Q and A, you could please um, uh, put your questions in the chat box. And based on the amount of time we have left, hopefully we can get to some of those questions. But let's go ahead and and get started. Um, I want to actually also start by by thanking the MCA staff who worked to to put this uh, together. A short amount of time, Nancy Lowry, Jackie Butler, Ivana Sanchez, and, and everybody else. I appreciate your, your putting this together, as well as our great speakers who I'll introduce shortly. Um, so it goes without saying that we are experience, experiencing a global game changing historical event. Only world wars have the far reaching impact of pandemics. Perhaps global warming will one day as well. But today we're facing a crisis of unparalleled social, health, and economic impact. The impact has been terrible to watch, addicting us to the daily infection and death statistics, trapping us at home, or forcing us to go to work, putting our health and the health of our families in peril, polarizing our politics. But I'm an eternal optimist and believe we have a chance to use this crisis to emerge as a better society than we were before. We have a chance to accelerate the best parts of change and evolution, such, such as telemedicine, rapid medical therapeutics and product development, unprecedented collaboration, and open source technology, technology sharing. But that is only if we don't get stuck in negative politics and cling to a past that seems archaic, even though it was only two months old. And we can do this through connecting, discussing, collaborating, and most importantly, by acting. And that's what we want to start doing today. When making health and, and economic policy and planning programs and services, we must look at the numbers, but we must also consider the human. We must use statistics and factors like the quality adjusted life year, a generic measure of disease burden used in economic evaluation to assess the value of medical interventions to make decisions on how to spend scarce resources. These are important and necessary calculations but there is also a very hum real human impact and that must be considered when using the numbers to design policy and practices. We are a complex society and we are also very human societies. Today, we will explore the numbers around the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the human experience. To delve into these topics, I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished speakers. Dr. Mark Elman is the founder of Southwest Eye Institute and Vista Surgery Center here in El Paso. He graduated from Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine and then completed his residency in ophthalmology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York, where he served as co-chief resident. Dr. Elman then moved to El Paso in 2004, where he started the Southwest Eye Institute, which is now the largest and most comprehensive group of eye doctors in the region. Dr. Elman now dedicates a portion of his practice to cataract surgery, and he's been working, working closely on the local COVID crisis as part of his position on the board of the El Paso County Medical Society. Dr. Arlozzi is an infectious diseases specialist serving patients in El Paso, Texas. He is also board certified in clinical informatics by the American Board of Preventative Medicine, making him one of less than 100 such certified physicians in the state of Texas. Dr. Alozzi received his medical degree from the University of Benin in Benin City, Nigeria. He completed his residency and internship in internal medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center, followed by his fellowship and MPH in infectious diseases at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Alozzi was honored and 
uh, to be recognized as the 2016 Best Physician in the City by City Magazine. He was also awarded the Pharmacy Award for Innovative Practices by the El Paso Pharmacy Association. He is a chair of the eHealth Advisory Committee uh, in HHSC, co-chair of the TMA Health IT Advisory, and on the TMA COVID and Telemedicine Task Forces. He is presently the Chief Medical Officer at Del Sol Medical Center, an HCA hospital here in El Paso. So really excited to have these speakers. Before we get started with them, I want to remind everybody to please mute their phones. We are having a little bit of feedback from, from someone, so please mute your phones. So we're going to begin the conversation today with Dr. Elman. Dr. Elman, when we planned this event, your father was recovering from COVID-19 in New York, where you are from. Unfortunately, we are very sad to notify our audience that your father passed away this past Friday, April 17th. I cannot express enough how deeply we hurt for you and your family, and we are so honored that you chose to move forward with this event. Your story is so important to understanding the human side of this pandemic. Would you please describe your father's journey with the illness? I'm going to turn it Thank over you. to him. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Emma. And um, yeah, this is this is a hard presentation for me to give. Obviously, it's my hope that by putting such a, a personal local spin on it, it can uh, have a, a positive effect in, in reminding people of the importance of staying isolated and uh, protecting themselves and their family. Yeah. You can hear me OK? Yes, we can. And we okay, see your great. screen now. All right, great. So I'm going to be talking about uh, my father, Murray Elman, uh, his journey, and ours as a family with him through this uh, horrible uh, journey that we went through over about the last So my dad, if I can say, was a pretty cool guy. He was born in 1944. He was 75 years old when he passed. He, uh, tr he was in Paris Island training as a Marine, and then he was in the New York Police Department where he spent a good portion of his career in what's called Fort Apache, the old 4-1 precinct in the South Bronx. Um, actually, that picture in the middle, my, my dad looks pretty disheveled. That is in the 1977 they had at the Great Blackout of New York. And what I cropped out of that picture is four people my father arrested that night when they had all the looting uh, during the blackout. And then uh, my favorite picture of all time is on the right-hand side where my dad uh, and his parents sitting in, uh, in the car. I just think that's an iconic picture. Um, one of my dad's uh, captain when he was in Fort Apache was Tom Walker, wrote a book called Fort Apache, the Bronx, which later became a movie with Paul Newman. Uh, on the, my dad's been mentioned in, in numerous books. On the left, in the middle, he was mentioned in a book uh, in, a, in a chapter called The Bronx is Burning. It was a uh, very wild, crazy, and different times back then. You'll also notice in the picture here, no bulletproof vests back then either. Um, one thing uh, that I found interesting in, in the past couple of weeks when my dad was sick, one of uh, his fa our family members found this article from 2004 from the New York Times about a little synagogue that my father was very involved with that was still existing in, in the South Bronx. And there are two sections of it that he pointed out to us. One where it said viral hope to Mr. Elman, and the other is Mr. Elman's the latest man to have caught the strange disease of hope that seems to have infected nearly everyone. So almost a, a weird foreshadowing there. So on March 12th, just a, a little bit before, you know, really everyone started realizing that the true, uh, uh, you know, Badness that we were about to encounter. Uh, my father, who was very involved with uh, police benevolence associations in New York, uh, in social organizations, um, he went to a uh, Honor Legion dinner, which I understand he hadn't missed in, in more than 20 years. And at that dinner, he spent about 15 minutes chatting with Chief Della Thorne, one of the uh, he's the New York NYPD Transit Bureau chief. The following day, he flew to Florida, and then a few days later, on March 16th, he saw the article that's on the right here from the New York Post that Chief Della Daudi tested positive for coronavirus. And approximately two days later, on a Wednesday, uh, Dad started to develop a fever and, and tiredness. 
And on Friday, he tried to get tested. They had a drive-through testing site at a park not far from uh, where he and his girlfriend were staying in Florida. And they ran out of tests, so they, they, they turned them away. So went back the next day, got there early at 7.30 for 9 o'clock testing. And he was told that they're not lighting up yet, come back in an hour. He came back in an hour, and he told me there must have been at least 100 cars, but he did finally get tested. And uh, Sunday passed, he wasn't doing too well, but Monday he actually sounded better to me over the phone. I was like, oh, thank God, he, he's starting to get over the, this virus. And then on Tuesday, he told me he felt good, but he sounded, sounded really bad. And I told him to go straight to the emergency room. And he was extremely weak. He actually almost collapsed or did collapse, I'm not sure, going into the emergency room. Um, so they found him to be a little bit hypoxic when he got to the emergency room. His oxygen was just a little bit low, but still doing pretty well. They put him on a nasal cannula, but by the next day, he was having more trouble oxygenating, so they had him on a full face mask. And around dinner time on Wednesday, the doctor told me he's on a full face mask, he's at 100% oxygen, he's breathing almost 40 times per minute. It's just not sustainable. They're going to recommend to put him on a ventilator. And so he was intubated uh, that Wednesday uh, night, March 18th. And yeah, he was, he was started actually, you know, he took an initial hit and he started improving. Uh, you know, the product of this disease, you kind of have two phases to it. You have a, you have the disease phase where you have the virus itself, but then you have what's called a cytokine storm. You have this massive body inflammatory response to the virus. And, and so you have to worry about both of them, but we don't know how to treat either of them. But it looked like he was getting through them on his own. In, in uh, the week of April 9th, he was actually improving every day. And, and the, he started to getting to the point that they, the doc, one of the critical care doctors that was on that night started lowering his sedation with the hopes of being able to extubate and to remove the, the ventilator and the tube in his throat. And then he, he, as we say in medicine, he just crashed. He, he, he started to go, his blood pressure started to drop and, and his body just, just started to shut down. His kidneys shut down, later his liver, and he never recovered. And at 4.41 a.m. on Friday, April 17th, he passed away. Um, and then we have since learned uh, that at least two other people who are at that same NYPD dinner uh, have since passed away. And I think there's a third who, who's critically ill and, and not, not looking good. Um, it, it's simply a horrendous disease. This picture on the right, uh, actually one of my dad's doctors sent me that she had seen it on a, uh, on a Facebook page showing the disease and somebody wrote over it, nothing works. And then, unfortunately, that's the stage that we're currently still at with this disease, even having had experience with it as a world for a couple of months and a country for at least a couple of weeks is that nothing seems to work. There's a lot of promising things in the news. You read a story, I got this medicine, I got recovered, I'm back to my family, and there's so much hope. But in reality, we're not seeing that in, in any significant numbers. And the other problem is, you know, normally in medicine, we do, uh, you know, significant trials. You know, if we wanna try a, a new medication, it'll, it'll be randomized, so half the people get it, half the people don't. We follow it for a couple of months at least and then see how people are doing. And we don't have the luxury of that time. We just have, we only have anecdotal, anecdotal information. Um, the other thing that we're seeing, the doctor, actually I was talking to his doctor about this after he passed away, is we're getting this biphasic response. You're getting this false hope. Patients are getting better and then all of a sudden they, they crash again and they don't recover. Um, and his, uh, his emergence, yeah, I'm sorry, his hospital in Florida, it's a pretty large ICU and they have not had anybody actually survive after being on the ventilator, um, as far as I know. Um, and it, you know, we're seeing this doesn't only affect those with advanced age or significant medical history. Yes, the, the incidence uh, of, of not surviving do go up with age and history. But there are, there are young people who are healthy and older people who are strong and healthy, like, like my dad relatively was, who are dying from this virus. It's also horrible from a social standpoint. You can't visit. Um, you know, nobody was allowed to go to the hospital. My, my father's you know, longtime partner lived five minutes away, and she wasn't allowed even to go into the hospital even on his last day. Um, Trying to get updates from the doctors is difficult because they're they're just they're in they're in panic mode. They're in the pandemic, trying to take care of patients. They sometimes can't come to the phone. 
And unfortunately, most of these patients die alone. If they're they're lucky, there'll be a phone next to their ear or there'll, there'll be a, a FaceTime on a tablet, but they're they're not responsive. The family can see them. And then even the funerals have strict restrictions. We were told that uh, his funeral would be limited to five minutes and, and limited people. It was actually uh, several people described New York to us as, as quote unquote radioactive right now, the, the amount of sick and death that they're seeing. The hospital they trained at, Montefiore Hospital, uh, one of my friends there told me that it's like a science fiction movie. There's the parking lot is empty, but the because there's no patient visitors, but the hospital is full of patients everywhere, uh, oxygen bottles everywhere, the endoscopy suites, the emergency the, uh, operating rooms, they're, they're temporary ICU units. Um, so not only could we, uh, you know, with their strict restrictions, but as a family, you know, most of us were not even able to, to go to the funeral. We had to watch it on Zoom, believe it or not. So I'll talk just a little bit about uh, some prevention things, and, and Dr. Elosi will talk about most of the science. Um, this picture on the right was, was a meme. Uh, in Spanish, it says on top, you know, would we really leave the house, house if we really knew this is what it looked like outside? And, and that's really true. It's, it's, this virus is very powerful. It seems to transfer very easily. And there's a very simple way to not get coronavirus, COVID-19, and that's to avoid contact with others. Uh, what makes this virus very different than, say, the flu is, is the incubation period, how long you can have it and not know that you have it. Um, for, you know, for example, I believe the flu, you know, about a day after getting it, you start to feel sick. But with coronavirus, it could be a week, even up to two weeks that you have it, you're spreading it, and you don't know it. It primarily spreads via two methods. It spreads via aerosol spray through, through respiration, talking, sneezing, coughing, breathing. Um, as well as picking it up on your hand, you touch something that somebody else touched and spread germs on and then touching your mouth, nose or eyes. So the, the keys to avoiding getting COVID-19 is isolation and as much as possible, just being home. If you're home and nobody else at home has COVID-19, you cannot get it. Um, if you do have to go out taking precautions such as social distancing, at least six feet from people around you, um, wearing a mask. Uh, generally, masks protect uh, the other people around you more than you, but it does even a regular face covering of any type is going to give you some protection and it's going to continue. If everybody has a mask on, it's going to slow down that aerosol spray around you. Um, hand washing or sanitizing on a regular basis, uh, never touching your face, which is easier said than done. And if you do have any medical symptoms, you should call your doctor. Don't just show up. That's better to call. Sometimes you could do a teleconference. Typically, uh, for, if you have just mild symptoms, the doctor will actually instruct you to stay home and isolate. Uh, but it's something to discuss with your doctor. So this is uh, on, the, on the right. Um, my dad's funeral was just yesterday. It was difficult to coordinate, but thank God we were able to get him a Marine and NYPD honors. Uh, on the left, you can see me and my dad about a year ago, and, and he was a tough, strong guy. And this virus, unfortunately, took him down and is taking down many others. So please pray for all those affected. Stay safe and stay isolated. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Alosi. Thank you, Dr. Elman. Um, I think we might take a one moment just to transfer the presenter mode over to Dr. Alozi. Thank you so much for for sharing your story. Um, you will. Dr. Alozi, are you on the line? Dr. Alozi? I see he's there, so he's on. I see him too. Um, I, we can't hear him though. He's at, he's giving me the, the give me a second. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. I was on my phone call, but that didn't work, so um, I switched over. But you guys can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you, and you are now the presenter. All right, I just have to grab it. Give me a second. Da, 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 da. 
I think I'm good. Can you can you see my screen yet, Emma? No. Not yet. Not yet. Ah, there we go. All right, cool. What about now? Yes, we can see your screen now. All right, and can you see the presentation now? Yes. Good, all right, so I just gotta move a bunch of things out of the way because <laughs> there's all sorts of stuff, yeah. So anyway, I guess, first of all, um, good afternoon. I thank everybody for taking the time and thanks to Mark for sharing that story. Um, him and I have been talking intermittently and it's really saddened to hear about the passing of his father. So um, Emma mentioned who I am. I'm chief medical officer right now at a Del Sol Medical Center, which is here in El Paso. I'm actually trying to flip over to a different screen, so give me a second. Yeah, that's the screen I want. There we go. Now we're on the right screen. And so really what I'd like to do is sort of go through this, not as a me talking about this, and I think Emma, you and I can sort of bounce it back and forth. Um, I put this together after actually having a conversation with Mark and some of his colleagues earlier in the month, and I thought just kind of formalize it. And so I think we all know what coronavirus is, SARS coronavirus 2, um, COVID-19, and no, it's not named COVID-19 because this is the 19th version. It's named COVID-19 because that's what the WHO described it as in December of 2019. And so I think it's important to always have a conversation about, well, where are we right now? All right. So I actually put this together last week, Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, the 13th, actually last week, Monday. Then you can see 1.9 million around the world, 582,000 in the US, updated it today. And I mean, these are actually remarkable numbers. And I think it bears noting that not only are these remarkable numbers, but we also are under testing. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later. When you think about, well, it's like this in the United States, what does it look like elsewhere? And so what I've done is put together a few sort of slides that will sort of, as I sort of talk about them, we can visualize them. So this really just shows the growth and the spread of coronavirus. And you can see as of January 21st in China, and then it starts to spread around the world. You have Italy, South Korea, United States, Spain, multiple countries come online. What you immediately see when you look at this is each country has a little bit different curve, right? You may ask, well, why is that? And I think that's really important to have that conversation. And again, one of the other things that I've done here, and I'll share this with the group later, is sort of put some um, reference materials and sort of data sources, right? So this is out of the Financial Times, John Murdoch does this. And again, you can see where the United States is in terms of deaths. We're hoping and believing that as New York starts to get better, deaths across America will start to plateau and hopefully fall. But again, that will be determined by how we as a society behave. And I'll touch on that in a moment. In El Paso, again, when I put this together last week, we're I think at 220 something, and now we're at 540, right? So again, interestingly enough, however, if we look at where we are, with El Paso compared to where we could have been, the projections that were made at the middle of March estimated that we'd be around 2000 cases right now, right? So we may have people say, well, we're not sheltering in place as much as we should, but even the sheltering in place that we've done, even the economic hardship that it's pushed upon the society has actually made a change in the way that we're doing things. You may talk about gaps, right? I've talked about the testing and where are the things that we need to get better at? I think testing, testing, testing. I'll walk you through this because it's important. You can see two countries and how they tested. The iceberg analogy is used for a lot of things. In Germany, I'm gonna to get to them second. The United Kingdom is actually a better representation. And so one of the things that happens in El Paso and Texas and most cities and areas in the United States is that we test people who present to a healthcare system. Either they go to the primary care doctor, 
an urgent care, a testing system, or a hospital emergency room. And so just like this iceberg, we're only testing on average the tip of the iceberg, those that are severely ill, potentially going to pass away. And so below that is where you get the rest of that iceberg. And that's what concerns people around how many people actually are living with coronavirus, not only in our region, but across the country. When you get to a situation where you can actually test or you become Germany. So not only are you testing people that are potentially passing away, those that have severe disease, those that have mild to moderate disease. And that changes not just your case fatality rate, but also changes how you monitor, right? Are you in containment? Or are you in mitigation mode? And I think that's really important to understand the difference. You've heard a lot of talk about testing and what we are or are not doing. I think all we can say is the numbers don't lie. If you compare South Korea to Italy to the United States, you can see that we have a large, long way to go in terms of how do we ramp up. And the concern is that in that month period, and they usually use South Korea because the United States and South Korea both announced, both announced <coughs> excuse me, their first patient living with coronavirus on January 21st, and you can see thereafter the gap in testing, right? And so that's where we feel a lot of those patients um, may have been contagious to other people. Testing is important again. And so when you look at the top 10 states with the highest percentage of testing, you don't see Texas. When you look at the bottom 10, we're there, right? And so again, these are one of those concerns that we may be opening up too early. Maybe we're not. How are we going to get our hands around testing? And so a lot of these concerns are yet to be determined. And again, this is just a slide that shows the differences in multiple states. And this was at the end of March. But again, some of the concerns are around how we are moving or not moving, especially in the South. And so the stay at home strategy is specifically allow, around some of the things that Dr. Elman talked about, which is the incubation period. And so on average, the incubation period for coronavirus is about five to seven days. And so you can see here, five to seven days, fever, chills, myalgia, people start to get sick, then they develop the cough, the sputum, you've heard about the diarrhea. Some people have a loss of smell or loss of taste before they then get to x-ray, potentially worsening x-ray. And then again, majority of people start to get well. Why that's important is that a lot of the things you've heard about the models, right? There's the model out of the University of Washington, the IHME model. There's a host of other models. They're all based on, can you stay home? In a perfect world, if we could shut down everything in the United States for 14 days, and I mean everything, wherever you are when that clock hits midnight, you do not move for 14 days, we would expect that coronavirus would essentially be gone from our country. Right? But obviously, we can't do that. We have people that are working in essential areas, people that need to help us with um, transportation, food delivery, cleaning, a host of other things that are really what we've realized are driving this country, right? Not just healthcare that's taking care of the sick. But I'm going to give you, there's a model that I actually do like, and I'll share that with the group. It's at the website called COVID Act Now. And so it looks at the country and it says our case is increasing, stable, or decreasing. So if you go into Texas, it'll refresh and it'll show what the projections are for Texas, right? And so as of today, um, if it, start, it started to talk about if restrictions are lifted now, right? And so it still anticipates that we would not be doing well. You can then go into the, every county in the state of Texas and you can see again, if restrictions are lifted, the concern is that by the middle of May, we would have overwhelmed our healthcare system with the dotted line being the healthcare system. If we stay at home for three months, you can see the distinct change in the number of cases and hospitalizations versus the, our capacity still stays up here, right? So again, lifted, not lifted. And so you can immediately understand why scientists and epidemiology and county health professionals are worried about the potential loosening of restrictions irrespective of a different conversation. The other thing that's important to note here is that when we looked at where did people move, where did they not move, right? One of the concerns, again, in the South, and Texas is part of that South, as we look at the red being the states or the areas that 
stopped moving the latest, right? So if you move really early, you're green. If you move really late, you're in red. And again, you can see the concerns where from Virginia to North Carolina, all across the South, all the way into East Central Texas. You may or may not have seen this. It gives a score, not just to the state, but to every um, to the country and every region in the country as well. And if my internet will refresh properly and I click on Texas, it actually gives Texas a D plus right now, right? So that's concerning. And if I go into El Paso, El Paso has actually been upgraded to a C minus. Right, again, so this is looking at cell phone towers and looking at how are people actually engaging in that shelter at home piece. There's a quick video I'm going to show and then I'll take questions before I continue the presentation. We wanted to see the true footprint social gatherings like spring break beach crowds could really have on our society in the face of the global pandemic. To do so, we started with the big picture powering our engine with billions of anonymized location data points from mobile devices across the globe. Using tectonics, we can then zoom in on specific regions. Here, we focus specifically on just one beach in Fort Lauderdale during the month of March. Again, each of these data points shown on the map corresponds to a unique mobile device active on a given day. You can see clearly that device activity spikes during the two week stretch of early to mid March, corresponding with spring break, no surprise. Now, using an analysis called the spider query, we can actually track movement of these devices over the remaining weeks of March, seeing where these devices went after spring breakers left the beach. As we zoom further and further out, it becomes clear just how massive the potential impact just one single beach gathering can have in spreading this virus across our nation. It can be hard for us to realize sometimes just how connected our world really is until the data tells the stories that we just can't see. So I'll tell you, when I first saw this video, probably about three or four weeks ago, the only thing that I looked at is were any, whether any of those dots were in El Paso. And so as you can see, they're not. But again, this is where the concern is around people when they say, well, opening the beaches, opening public place, places. Yes, but it only takes that kind of intermingling and traveling to potentially spread the virus. Another conversation that people have had is around flights, right? So there's a website that we use called Flight Radar 24. And this again, it loads properly. I'll do Houston. And so loading, my internet will work properly. Of course, my internet doesn't want to work right now. Come on. I always laughingly say that there's never, in my former life, as a chief health informatics officer, there's never a time that I've given a presentation of it. something technical hasn't failed. Now we've actually gotten much better. So you can see this is Houston. And as I scroll out, these are the planes that are actually in the air. If I had done this a week ago, you would have seen almost twice as many planes in the air. And even last week, we were down 70% from a normal day in Houston. I only show this because if I were to go to Milan, for example, I use Milan as an example a lot, just because Italy has been um, hit historically. Let's see if this works. Of course it doesn't really work. <laughs> and if it doesn't work on this refresh, I'll just um, make the point, but... Let's see, if I go to Milan, if you've ever been to that airport, you can see this is the northern part of Italy and it's very different, right? So this is the hot spot in Europe at a given point in time, very different. One thing I'll call to your attention, if you go a little bit north, you can see Germany. Germany put in restrictions much faster, much quicker. And so they've started to open up already. Again, these are just sort of things to, um, add to the picture and the story. And so I think, Emma, I'll stop there for a second to see if there are any questions before I sort of round up with some of the clinical and PPE con conversations. Do we have any questions from, from the audience? We were requesting that uh, you, you submit your questions through the, the chat box. That's your head. Well, my daughter just asked if she could download an app, but that's not what we're talking about, right? Um, and I, 
Well, I can keep going to the end if there are no questions immediately. You know, I, I have questions about, uh, you know, uh, a, a couple of things. Number one, um, you know, your numbers on El Paso and again, Texas having, I think you said a D and El Paso having a C minus in terms of our movement. Um, we are on a major international border, as most people know. Um, mm -hmm. And we we have, uh, I think our, that makes El Paso very unique to other communities that are dealing with it because we are directly impacted by other countries' uh, decisions, their policies, um, their compliance, et cetera. And so um, we don't have very good numbers coming out of Mexico, um, but we do have a free flow still of uh, commerce coming over our land ports, our seven land ports, and we have um, U.S. citizens, which there are over 100,000 U.S. citizens in the state of Chihuahua who can travel back and forth right now freely. Um, in your opinion, how does that impact our, our models and um, our projections and, and what we should be looking at? Yeah, so a couple of things. I think that you're right. And part of it is the problem of testing, right? Because we don't have an abundance of testing, it makes the numbers and the projections and the models very low reliability. And I'm just stealing one of the words that somebody that asked a question on the chat box says, they're absolutely correct, right? The reliability of the data that we have adds noise to all projections, right? If you don't have reliable numbers, you can't make proper projections. I think to speak specifically to our case here in El Paso, you're 100% right. We're not sure exactly what's going on in Juarez because I think from a sort of national standpoint, the president has an endorsed testing I mean, those of us in the healthcare space that have friends that are over there and sort of get these anecdotal reports or just specific epi reports are concerned because some of the hospitals are now reporting that they're having 10 to 20 persons living, right, in their hospitals that have atypical pneumonia, right? And that's abnormal for them because usually they wouldn't have that many people with atypical pneumonia. And so the assumption that atypical pneumonia is potentially coronavirus. And I think on either Friday or Saturday, we heard that they had 20 deaths in one day, right? So that adds an uncertainty. So how do we plan? How do you plan how to potentially reopen or change the modeling around what's happening in El Paso, given that piece? And I think there's no great answer, but we aren't going to know, right? We can only manage what we can manage here in El Paso um, and kind of go from there understanding that, quote unquote, potentially we have a ticking time bomb across the border. And we, we also have a question about uh, the reliability and the sensitivity of the test for the virus. And I don't know if you're gonna talk testing later or if this is a good time to, to talk testing. I'll, t I'll take the testing question at the end. We have another question here. Uh, do you think things will eventually go back to normal or will there be a new normal to adhere to? I mean, I, I personally think that we are going to have to adapt to what a new normal is. It, again, part of it is what are we defining as normal, right? I think if we're saying what when we return this summer to what our life was in January, I truly believe it's unlikely for a host of reasons. I think, right, one, we have no evidence anywhere that there's any successful novel therapy that's able to change the course of this virus. There's a host of things that are in clinical trials, and I'll get to that in a bit. There's a host of anecdotal evidence about various things, and there's the hope of a vaccine. Prior to today, the fastest time that we've ever gotten to a vaccine has been four years. Now, the technology that exists in April 21st of 2020 is different than that time, right? We have micro RNA arrays. We have a host of other things. There's a bunch of research groups, not just in the United States at the NIH, but some private groups that were doing vaccine trials on coronavirus and SARS, the initial SARS, right? So they're a little bit ahead of the game and hopefully they could potentially get to some real um, bios by the fall. But even if they get to the fall, I think people need to understand that maybe they have 100,000 or 200 vials of that vaccine. We have almost 300 plus million people in the country, right? Even if we say we need to get to 50% herd immunity to be quote unquote safe, that's 150 million. That's ramping up from zero, a new vaccine line, 
right? So do we stop producing MMR for the kids that need it or Tdap or whatever? Do we stop producing influenza virus um, vaccines? I think those are all the things that were, when we think about how soon will we get a vaccine, it's really 12 to 18 months if we're lucky for the general public. And so I think that really is going to start to define what is the new normal, right? How comfortable are we going to be? Even if we were to say May 1st, open everything up. Okay, that's great. There are 22 million people plus that are unemployed. How comfortable are employers going to be to rehire them, understanding that their restaurants, sporting events, um, travel places, hotel, Vegas, et cetera, right? Are not going to be comfortable packing their arenas and um, hotels and restaurants all over again from scratch. And so I think we're looking at something that's going to go on for a while around that space. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're, we're in this for the long haul. I mean, estimates by both financial and hospital groups are shooting for 12 to 18 months until we return to what could potentially be considered normal. And I can see the questions too. And so what I'm gonna do really quickly is run through the rest of this and then I'll circle back to the questions because some of those questions are aligned around some of the things I'm gonna talk about. And so one of the things, I'm actually gonna skip this video. I'm gonna go to a different video if it can work. Fauci, uh, there was a, a worldwide study made of 6,000 doctors in 30 different countries and uh, uh, the uh, final percentage was 37% of the doctors said that hydroxychloroquine was the most effective treatment against COVID-19. Now, here in the United States right now, uh, only about 23% of the doctors prescribe it, which is far less than other countries. And we had Dr. Oz on just one hour ago, and he actually was talking about this story. And uh, Dr. Oz, Dr. Fauci, has this question to you about the studies. I wonder if he was impressed uh, or what his thoughts are about the Chinese study that we discussed yesterday from Wuhan that reflected statistically significant improvement in recovery from fever, from cough, and in the pneumonia as well. Yeah, you want my response to that? So there you go. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, so that was not a very robust study. It is still possible that there is a beneficial effect but the study that was just quoted, and on a scale of strength of evidence, that's not overwhelmingly strong. It's an indication, a hint of it. But getting back to what you said just a moment ago, that X percent, I think you said 37% of doctors feel that it's beneficial. We don't operate on how you feel. We operate on what evidence is. And so I think Mark spoke to this, right? And so just as a counterpoint, move on to hydroxychloroquine. They did a study, a uh, limited study in a VA hospital, and they came effectively. So looking forward and giving it as they as collecting data as they're going along, like in France or the randomized trials from China have shown benefits, but only really when it's given earlier to patients. The fact of the matter is, we don't know. Thankfully, these doc these medications are prescription only. The doctors are desperately awaiting the completion of the higher quality randomized trials. And we've you've covered them on the show several times. Uh, in South Dakota, University of Minnesota now has over a thousand patients randomized. Uh, there's additional trials going on. Let's get that data so we know what we're dealing with. And so I think that's really the concern in the medical community, right? That we're flying this plane while we're building it. And in some cases, and I completely understand why we've sort of thrown evidence and normal clinical practice out the window. We have to be careful. We have to protect people. Um, and understand that that data will come and that science will come. As of, I think, April 4th, there were 301 clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov, some that are looking at hydroxychloroquine, some that are looking at a host of um, and an array of different therapeutic modalities that hopefully at least one or two of these will be something that can change the pattern of disease in those that have it now and those that have it into the future. I think it's important sort of going back to the question of what the new normal is or what will the new normal be, is that there's an anticipation or a suspicion that there'll be multiple waves of this, right? Okay, sorry. That we are presently in wave one, which is the immediate morbidity and mortality. We're probably gonna have a second wave of something, right? Even if it's because of resource restrictions, people that have urgent non-COVID conditions, we're gonna have a post tail wave. So those are in the ICU when they come out, 
Where are they gonna go? What's their rehab plan gonna be? How are they gonna get healthier? We're going to have those people that have diabetes, cancer, hypertension, heart disease, a host of other chronic conditions right now, who because of the fear of coming into healthcare, haven't been engaged in care, right? There's a wave of those that will become sicker as we go into the summer and potentially the fall. And I think it's very important to understand that whether you're in healthcare or not giving care, there's going to be a wave of people that either have trauma because of PTSD. Places like New York, where at a point in time, I have colleagues that were intubating one patient every 10 to 15 minutes. That's unheard of. They've never seen that. They were digging graves, right? Those are all people that are going to have emotional trauma from this. The economic injury that we're doing not only to the economy as a whole, but the individuals who have lost their jobs and are struggling, and then just burnout can't be on a heightened state of alert constantly. You, ben you eventually burn out your system. In terms of testing, there's a host of possibilities around testing. Right now, what we have is what's called the PCR, right? So reverse transcriptase um, polymase chain reaction or the NAA testing, right? Those are a host of those that are now um, rapid tests. So the 15-minute test that Abbott has called the Abbott ID Now, another company called Cepid has, I think, a 30-minute test. And there will be more and more of those coming out. I think those um, have some value in terms of creating that um, iceberg so we can get to the bottom piece of that iceberg and know who really has the disease and who really doesn't have the infection or the disease. I think one of the questions that's out there is, what about the antibody tests, right? So again, I think the good thing about antibody testing is that in a controlled and studied manner, you can potentially use an antibody test to determine who has immunity. We're not in a controlled manner that we would usually use for other disease states, right? And so one of the other things in more studied conditions, whether it's HIV or hepatitis C, or even in coronavirus and influenza, right? We have a pattern as to how these antibodies work how high they are for you to have to have some immunity, how low they are. For example, when people get vaccines, we actually can measure the titer of their antibody and say, hey, this person needs a retesting um, or a re-injection um, of the vaccine series, right? We're not there with the coronavirus or COVID-19 because we don't have enough information. And so it's very possible that you could test positive for an antibody test and still get it. In fact, there seems to be some data out of, I think it was, um, China or South Korea, actually, where people that had a positive antibody test actually got reinfected with virus, right? Now, that hasn't been completely peer-reviewed. It was just early print um, journal that came out a few days ago, but that's concerning. I think the other thing that we have to sort of pump the brakes, and you'll hear a lot of noise around antibody testing, is what are the test criteria of these testing, right? Remember, Usually the FDA would should or would do a more diligent process around the screening, whether these tests work, what's their test characteristics, what's the sensitivity, what's the specificity. I give a, an example. Let's assume like a city like El Paso, a million people, and we just make an assumption that there a prevalence of 5% of El Paso has gotten infected at some point in time, right? So that's about 50,000 people. The best test on the market right now for antibody has about a 95% sensitivity, 95% specificity. It's actually 93.8 and 95.6, but I'll use 95% across the board for this numbers. Looking at that test, the true positive is about 47,500. The false positive is also about 47,500. So you're telling me if you're a proponent of that antibody test that you would give a health worker that test and with a flip of the coin chance, 50-50, you would make a decision on who to send back to work. I don't think that's what we should do. And I don't think that's acceptable to somebody that would potentially be putting their life on the line or their health or the health of their family on the line based on a 50-50 test. And so I think that's one of the concerns um, that are gonna be in the healthcare community. Sort of pivoting back, and again, I'll get to all these questions, sort of pivoting back to where we are today, what the new normal is. What I think is remarkable is, and Emma, you and I have had these conversations, whether at the MCA when I used to have my office there at various conferences, and people would always say, well, digital transformation is years away. We don't have to worry about it. It's not something we have to think about. We have Zoom or GoToMeeting or WebEx, and that's really the height of it. We're not into mobile apps. We can't do telemedicine. 
And then the wrecking ball called COVID-19 came. And within 72 hours, whether on a federal level through the president's enactment of emergency procedures or on the state level with Governor Abbott, we all of a sudden had what's called payment parity. So a physician could bill the same amount for seeing somebody by telemedicine that they could for an inpatient visit, something that we had been told for the last decade was impossible. People could use whatever modality they wanted to, whether it was the apps they already had in their electronic medical record or FaceTime or Zoom or WhatsApp, whatever the case may be, right? All these changes, even the world around us, our kids are going to um, ISD at home. We're doing a host more of these kind of in-person sort of celebrity squares videos, right? With all the videos around the screen. Again, what the world will be 12, 18, whatever time it is from now, won't be the world that we knew in January of this year. And I think that's important. You've probably already heard whether it's the Google or Apple or a host of other organizations, both locally and across the world, trying to figure out how to use technology to hack this process, right? Do you have an app on your phone that says you're positive? Does it use bit, does it use blockchain to engage with another person's phone? These are all sort of to be determined because that's not how we operate in the United States on average, but maybe there's an appetite to go that way for the safety of the community. I don't know. Again, these are all things sort of to think about. You may or may not have seen this. This is a testing station in South Korea. These are some of the things that we were actually thinking about from a healthcare standpoint for drive-through testing and a host of other things about a month ago. The fact that the tempo and intensity of transmission seems to have slowed down has put this sort of on the back burner. But again, is this something that we need to get to at some point in time if this recovers? For those of you that are out there that are either in the maker space or the um, fabrication space or have connections to that, one of the biggest questions across the country and locally has been how do we get access to this PPE or personal protective equipment, right? There's a whole host of classes with the standard being N95, but KN95 now is also acceptable through um, per the CDC a few weeks back. And so that kind of brings us to that sort of makerspace, whether it's UT Austin that has the black and white designs or Fab Labs that's aligned a host of groups across the city, really done some amazing work in trying to produce um, face shields and N95 respiratory, respiratory masks. And we work with them on some of their designs as well, right? So anything you can do to support them would be good. I think in closing, before I take questions, May we never again take for granted Friday nights with friends, birthday celebrations, the roar of a stadium, mornings at the gym, packed dance floors, coffee with a friend, crowded concerts, happy hour, or life itself. Cherish every day you have. I've had friends that I've lost from this pandemic. Dr. Elman has lost his father. A host of others have lost family members again. We have to find a way to get through this. I know we will get through this. And with that, I will take any questions that are out there. You know, I, I do wanna uh, quickly plug a lot of the efforts that you were mentioning our local um, community that has really stepped up to produce PPE. I know there are many innovators in our community that are innovating ventilators, um, you know, face masks. I know our medical device manufacturing industry in El Paso and Juarez has really uh, been working hard over the last month to ramp up production of PPE or pivot to making PPE if they were making other things. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, we've gone to such a global economy, but we need to always think of local solutions and being sure that we can take care of our, our own communities. I agree. Um, there are a host of questions. Uh, <laughs> Coming at. Do you want to narrate them, or do you want me to just run through them from top to bottom? I, I think uh, based on your your uh, logic, you can. I think you don't have to go top to bottom. You know, just attack them as you. Okay, fit. fair enough. Um, one of the questions I got is how reliable and sensitive is the test for the virus? I sort of alluded to that when I was talking about the antibody test. I think it's important to know that each different test, and I looked at this. Uh, I think on Tuesday or maybe on Monday for a different group, I think there were 32 tests for PCR that are on the FDA website. 
their test characteristics ranged between 88% sensitivity and 96% sensitivity. Again, no test is perfect. And I think it's also important to understand that under what's called an EUA or an emergency youth authorization from the FDA, a lot of these tests were not um, tested or um, the validity of them was not the same as it would be under the normal process, right? Because we're in a pandemic situation. So again, I think from a clinical standpoint, yes, we use the test, but we also use the clinical suspicion to see whether that person matches that clinical suspicion. There's another question here. About um, before you leave that topic, um, I, I did hear someone uh, talk about, uh, and, and this is very pertinent for you, but reaching into the lessons learned from HIV AIDS and the initial testing that wasn't very reliable there, but that what, um, what a practice became is that if you do a semi-unreliable test twice and you get the same result, your probability of having an accurate answer um, goes up significantly. And so that could always be an option um, when, you know, in dealing with unreliable tests. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so completely agree. So if you look at some of the algorithms around HIV, hepatitis C, um, syphilis is one of them, right? The only caveat to that is that's in a situation where you have an abundance of testing. So for example, if somebody comes into the hospital, bilateral pneumonia, fevers, cough, not doing well, and their test is negative, in all reality, both the hospitalist team, the pulmonary critical care team, will still treat that person as if they have COVID-19 disease. Now, they have to make a decision about whether they want to retest on the same platform or if they have opportunity, retest on a different platform, right? And so I think that's a fair um, process to go about. Like you said, two different tests, either on the same platform or send it out to a different platform. But I think that's more than fair to retest if need be, if the clinical suspicion rises to that level. <clears throat> All right, I'll take the next question as well. So what are your views on BCG vaccine and increasing immunity against the virus? Well, I mean, anecdotally, I have a BCG vaccine, and so I hope that's real. I think from a science standpoint, if you look at Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where BCG is still used, they still continue to have um, COVID transmission. Right, and so I've heard it. I've talked to the Nigerian CDC. We're actually on a um, national WebEx on Sunday where we talked about it, and the data doesn't seem to hold up. Um, I think there's a hope across a host of nations that that may be something that's there, but we'll see what happens. I think also alongside that is one of the thoughts initially was that it was BCG and hydroxychloroquine because Africa and some parts of Asia didn't have a very high number of infections. I think it's important to note that whether it's SARS for MERS or multiple other pandemics, the 1918 um, pandemic is one that historical records show, Africa specifically, because it has about 5% of the world's travel, was four to six months later than the rest of the world, right? And so I think, again, um, there are certain things that we can look at. There's a lot of confounders in that. I think it's just yet to be determined, but we'll go from there. I see another question that says, what are your thoughts and recommendations to increase testing to the point that everyone is tested? If everyone is tested, do you think at least there's a pallet for decreasing public health privacy in the United States? <clears throat> Great question. I mean, I'm, I'm as blunt as they can be. I think it's a fallacy that we're ever going to get to the amount of testing that we need to even get to 30% of the population in this short period of time. Talk us of all. If we were in this sort of Disney make-believe land, be able to get to everybody testing, then we technically wouldn't need to use some of those um, more invasive sort of reduction in health privacy things around testing and tracking because we could test everybody at the same time. I think the reality is that there is going to be a run on supplies for testing. Obviously, the president enacted the, I think the War Power Production Act, and hopefully that will ramp some things up. But some people are recommending or saying that we need three to five million tests a day. We're nowhere near three to five million tests a day, right? And I'm not sure how we're going to be able to ramp up to that level in the near future, understanding we're not the only place in the world that's trying to get those materials to make the test. 
and do the reagents and a whole host of other things. So if it was a perfect world, yes, um, I think we're far away from that. Another question, what testing options or testing matrix, antibody lab, others should we ramp up going forward? Are there new tests in development that you're excited about? I think one of the ones I'm most excited about is the saliva test. But again, um, looking at the emergency use authorization and looking at some of the test criteria, a little bit concerning about false negatives, right? We can't have too many false negatives in a test or it gives people a false sense of security around where they really are. I think that the plethora of tests that exist is good and bad. And just like when we had VCR and Betamax, there's a percentage of the tests that use interchangeable testing strips and reagents and swabs, and there's a percentage of them that are proprietary. The problem is that if an organization or a community goes with a proprietary standard and then they run out of that supply chain, they can't pivot easily, right? It's expensive. And so I recommend to groups that are smaller and mid-range that if they're going to focus um, on a community-wide or a health system-wide testing strategy, it has to be aligned to the testing strategies that have interchangeable tests. And so I think that's important. Um, the last you know question. Oh, Just sorry. to continue on that one real quick, um, uh, there, there's a lot of um, emphasis on employee, as we're starting to think about reopening the economy, employers want access to testing to test their employees. Um, what, what kind of um, logic would you advise employers to use in terms of testing? Should every employee be tested and how frequently should they be tested? Should there be sample testing where a certain percent of employees get tested? Um, should there be sample testing and then changes in workplace where, uh, you know, if, if, you know, employees who have tested negative all stick together or in pods, how do you see that rolling out with logic? Yeah, I, I think the, it's a great question. My biggest concern around all of it, and I mean, I will, couple of things. My biggest concern around all of it is I'm not sure as a society that we're ready to quote unquote reopen. I think that the White House, in all honesty, brought out a very fair proposal, which is tier your reopening to three pieces. One of the first pieces of that tiered approach was, do you have enough tests? And so what I would ask those employers is, do you have enough tests? Do you have a supply chain that allows you to get enough tests. If the first answer is no, I mean, in an if-then scenario, to me at least, it seems that you stop there and you can't go to the second phase. However, I understand the society that we're in and people will push to do it irrespective of the tiered approach. If you then get to a point where you say, well, I only have 50 tests and I have 500 employees, how do you determine who to test? Is one group of employees more important than the other? Does another have a higher touch point in terms of other staff? And forget about um, other um, customers and forget about the customers. What about the staff? How do you know that the person you're working with goes home directly? And even if they're at home, there's nobody sick at home, but maybe goes somewhere else, maybe goes to the park, maybe goes to a restaurant, bar, gets on a plane to go to New York, DC, wherever it may be. I truthfully think, Emma, that there's no good, easy logic around giving an employer that rationale because the pieces, the foundational pieces don't exist. If at least we have the foundational pieces, then we can escalate to, you know what, I'm going to be on a rotational staffing grid where five days a week, I'm going to bring in 20% of my staff. And of those 20%, I'm going to test half of them, at least, if that's the numbers. I'm making these up as I go, right? But those are the numbers of tests that I have. And then maybe you take a risk at herd immunity. Maybe you say, hey, um, if you're in a quote-unquote at-risk group, higher-risk group, you don't get to come back to work at all, right? But again, like Dr. Elman mentioned, the initial information and data that we had out of Wuhan and Italy that talked about essentially strictly 60 and above, we've had, again, these are not large databases, but we've had situations where people in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s have gotten this, and we're not sure why. The question becomes, is that the risk you're willing to take? 
I know some people right now that are more than willing to take that risk. They can't afford not having a job. They can't afford being at home. And so they need to go back to work. I don't know from a societal standpoint how we make a decision about risk versus reward. That's way above my pay grade and people much smarter than me are gonna to try to make those decisions. And then I got two more questions. Although I know studies are currently happening, in the, sorry, sorry about that. Um, although I know studies are currently happening and no solid evidence is available yet, is there any promise for using plasma from recovered patients while vaccines become available? Great question. So you're speaking of convalescent sera. Again, I'm of a strong belief that a lot of these, what are called novel therapies, be done alongside or within the realm of a clinical trial. I think we do a disservice, not only to our patients, but to ourselves when we just shotgun it and throw whatever we hear about on Newsweek, Fox News, CNN, or in journals that aren't even in primary language English that most of us can't read. We try them on our patients and turn them into guinea pigs. Um, I'm, that's my very strong belief that we have to understand that we can't use people to experiment and then not have data that's valuable to guide care. In saying that, however, um, convalescent Sera has some past data in other settings, right? And again, we can't take past settings to extrapolate into today. The Mayo Clinic has a convalescent Sarah protocol and the clinical trial that is ongoing. I know a couple of other places around the country and around the world are in that protocol. And I think we just gotta wait and see. And this, again, being an ID guy, being an epi guy, a tech guy, I think one of the things, right, is it's disheartening. And again, I attended a funeral on Saturday for a friend of mine from college that died of this last week. And I understand the pain to some extent, right? But I also understand that if we take the disease as a whole, we do ourselves a disservice if we throw a million medications at somebody when the true mortality rate is only 1%, even if it's 2%. Right? We don't have enough effect size to give people going forward the right tools to face this. And that's really my biggest fear in terms of that. And the last question, great question. Um, what, are the, what are your thoughts about using a pulse, oximeter, a pulse oximeter for self-monitoring of COVID-19? I think if you are um, asymptomatic, I don't think that would add any benefit. I think, however, if you have shortness of breath, cough, fever, and you have access to a pulse oximeter, I don't think there's anything wrong with using that. In fact, it actually gives either your PCP or the urgent care, the ER that you call, I think it gives them some good information, right? Because if you're at home in 86, 88%, that's a very different conversation around fever and cough versus somebody that's at 96, 98%. I think that is good information. It's what we use in um, clinics and clinical settings to assess how people are doing as well. You know, I, I wanna throw a, a question at Dr. Elman. And, um, you know, after hearing all of this and um, knowing that he is probably as updated on all the uh, latest and greatest treatments, treatment options and trials, um, as a as a clinician, but also having someone in the family going through it, having you know gone through the journey with your father, what what do you wish could have been done differently, perhaps with his treatment, um, and and really how do you even manage the personal and professional struggle between throw everything at him to help him get better or reserving that for for data? Well, that was part. Of, can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. That was, that was actually a huge part of my personal struggle. You know, being not only his son, but being a physician, you know, I wanted to make sure that he was getting the best care. And my dad was in a hospital in Florida where I don't know the hospital, I don't know the doctors, I, I don't know anybody involved. I can't go visit, I can't be there. And uh, that, that was actually, uh, you know, just a whole new world for me not to be able to have that kind of hands on involvement in my family's care. And, uh, the, you know, we were looking at all options, and I'm on physician uh, physician code boards on Facebook and on WhatsApp, 
and there's so much panic on there. The same panic I I had, you know, my my father's ill, or my colleague's father is, you know, father or brother is ill. Does anybody can anybody donate plasma A positive or, you know, in so much franticism, trying to reach for a treatment, when in reality, like Dr. Losi said, we still just don't know what works. You know, my dad went into the hospital now a month ago. And as of a couple of days ago, when I talked to one of his uh, older providers, they're still not much more advanced than they were. They're, they're on some trials now, but so far, nothing has seemed to be a, a silver bullet that, that's helping this. And actually, I was going to ask Dr. Olsen to comment on it. He, he told me something very interesting about, you know, back in the day when, they, when HIV first came out. And Dr. Lose, if you want to tell me what you told me the other day about HIV treatments, you know, in the panic versus after. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at the early days of HIV, right, I mean, the conversation around chloroquine existed even then. There were some antifungals and some antibacterials that people said would work. I remember when I was in my MPH, um, we did one of the national trials at the University of Minnesota around IVIG and steroids for people with HIV and whether that would boost their CD4 count, right? And again, in the myths of it, it sounds like it makes a lot of sense, but then you need that data and you come out of that chaos and you see all of a sudden, oh, wow, we may have done people harm by doing these things, right? And again, so the VA study that was released yesterday or the day before seemed to show that in that older population, in the non-randomized oh. clinical trial, right, that people that got hydroxychloroquine actually died more. Right. There was another study, I think, out of Belgium or France, that, or Brazil. The Brazil study showed the same thing, that people on hydroxychloroquine actually had more mortality than people that weren't on it. And so, again, and me and Mark have these conversations, right? And it's hard, right, when you have a friend and a colleague that's in the battle and balancing, I understand having a family member that's dying, but at the same time, that science part of it, right? When you're a physician, you've done these trials, trying to be like, oh man, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. And I think part of it, and this is not just a physician thing, I think a lot of us, whether on this call or in society, that are trying to do what's right and trying to sort of grow and be better people, we're all we're all on average type A's. And type A's have one driving characteristic. They don't like to not be able to do something we're wired to hell. And so what has happened is that as a society, because we're so scared and so impotent in terms of the tools at our disposal, we just wanna do something, right? And anything becomes something. And I guess, again, my fear is that we do all these things and we're no further along the road of scientific discovery or an actual treatment to help the people that will come tomorrow and the next tomorrow. And that's what frightens me the most about all of this. I think another concern is just the unpredictability still of the disease. You know, why do healthy 30-year-olds die and, and some sick 90-year-olds get a little little flu-like symptoms and do fine? 100%. You know, when you're looking at, you know, anecdotal or even small studies, you know, even a study of 50 or 100 people, that, that's, that's so tiny that you, we just don't know if those are statistically significant, if those people would have just done well anyway because we have no set rules. This, this disease does not follow any set rules. We have a new question about a study using an Ebola drug. Ah, yeah, remdesivir, the Gilead drug. So like you said, um, remdesivir was initially used for Ebola. It had really mixed results, didn't really seem to do anything. So it was one of those drugs, again, where a drug company had the drug, let's try it, we're building this plane as we're flying it. Some of the early data seemed to show some benefit, right, again, in vitro data. Again, one of the concerns about remdesivir, and I, I have no problem with people prescribing it in the setting of a clinical trial. And I understand the compassionate use basis of it. But for example, one of the sort of um, news articles that came out end of last week, early this week was the Chicago data. And again, as a researcher, what concerns me about this is this. If you have a successful therapy for a disease state, and I tell you, Emma, hey, I treated 10 people, 100% success. 
you're going to tell Dr. Elman, hey, Oge did this, you try it. He'll treat it. Maybe 80% success, 90% success. Eventually, you'll get 500 people, 90% success. We don't have that. Not only do we not have that, but my concern is that what we have is physicians trying something on 20 people, 30 people, and then running to the press. What does the press have to do with helping the patients, right? What's your motivation if your first thing is to call Reuters and not go to a scientific journal or not publish that data? I think that we will get information about remdesivir because there's an NIH-sponsored trial. It is randomized controlled. I'm not a fan of it because now it's not randomized double-blinded placebo. It's open label, so you can switch it out if you feel the patient's getting sicker. There's always going to be some bias and confounding there. And instead of a dichotomous endpoint where it's get better or death, it's seven. It's a seven-point scale. And anytime you add multiple scales to something, it's concerning. The other thing about it is that they just um, recently had to increase their um, person per arm from, I think, 500 to 2,400. Again, that tells me they're concerned about the power to show any effect. Right, so we're going to get data. There's a lot of things that will come on board. I think from a practical standpoint, because I like to go from sort of my nebulous pie in the sky to what's on ground. Right now in El Paso, there's no hospital that has access to remdesivir. Every single hospital in the city. Jesus Christ. I truly don't know what's going on my phone. I have no idea where that's from. Sorry, give me a second. Ooh, that's what happens when you have way too many browsers open. Anyway, um, back to El Paso. There's no hospital that has it right now. We've all applied. We've all been turned down by Gilead. Gilead is directing it primarily to number one hotspots or to um, above 60 and pediatric use right now. We actually tried getting remdesivir for my father and it was it was impossible. Uh, they were doing some compassionate use. They've even limited that now, I think, only to children and pregnant women uh, or yes. clinical trials. Um, the hospital he's at is actually on a clinical trial now, you know, of, after he passed away or right before, I'm not, I'm not sure, he finally got on it, but uh, it's still, it's, it, it's a moving target. Hello, I'm Andy Johnson. I have a question. I would like to know if there are any numbers about the people who are homeless, the migrant population, the Native American population, the Asian population, and people in jails, people who are homeless. I don't hear any information being shared about those groups. What's going on with them? So I think you mentioned um, a list of vulnerable populations, including migrants, Native American. I didn't hear one of the other ones. The I think, Asians and homeless and people in jails. Ah, uh, yes. So I think that one of the things that I was told by um, an old professor when I was at the University of Minnesota is that one of the things about viral diseases is that they expose the cracks in your community and they also expose the cracks in your healthcare, right? HIV did the same, hepatitis C did, um, chronic diabetes and heart disease is doing that in the South, right? What we're seeing right now where people say, well, why is this affecting people of color? Why is this affecting, I think up in Colorado or in one of the Dakotas, there was um, a Native American community that it's ravaging that community. This is all boiling down to our public health system, right? And cities, counties, states, municipalities that have good public health, advanced public health, and have had a way to sort of equalize healthcare, they're going to do much better with this kind of pandemic than those that do not. Right. New York has one of the best public health systems in America, and the issue was they were just overwhelmed. They were hit with a tidal wave that they could not recover from until it took its toll on. One of the messages to the mayor locally, to the governor, to governors across the country is 
we have to be careful around this because it will clearly expose the cracks that we have in our society. We already know that Chicago had one of the largest outbreaks in America until the one in North Dakota at the uh, manufacturing plant, right? Chicago had, I think, about 400 cases in the jail. Again, this is a disease of public health, not necessarily, and unfortunately, public health affects the cracks in the society. And we're going to have to come to some sort of, um, we're going to have to come to terms as a society is what's important to us, right? And I guess uh, three months ago, if you'd asked my daughter who the coolest person in America is, it would have been some person I don't know that's on Instagram or TikTok. Don't get me wrong, she's 13, she still watches TikTok, but she's a lot more engaged around inequities and public health and what are her mom and dad who are doctors doing to help people and how can they, how can we donate to a food bank and how can we do things that are helping people that don't have. Our country as a whole is gonna have to sort of wrap our heads around that because historically we've done a really poor job of it. And one more thing, I have not heard any mention about the people in our long-term care facilities, our nursing homes. What about those uh, people? 100%. So I think one of the things about, and you probably know that one of the initial outbreaks in the United States was that nursing home in um, Kings County up in Washington, here in Seattle, Washington. And if you look across the country, there's been multiple outbreaks in nursing homes. I think what we've done a good job of here in El Paso with Dr. Ocaranza and the health department is focusing on some of those long-term facilities when there's a patient that's positive, helping or trying to help the organization with the PPE that they need. And so I think that's been one of the things. In terms of hearing about it, I think the focus is there. It may not be what's on the El Paso Times or KVIA or KTSM, but I do know in the healthcare and the public health department community, those are all things that are being focused on. Thank you. Pleasure, great question. So, so we are running low on time. Um, there, there is a, a question about whether um, you can be contacted for, um, you know, for follow-up discussion. I, I know doctors don't uh, always like to give out their email address, and um, so um, I'm, I'm happy to put my email address in the chat box um, because it's widely available. And so, if anyone has a question or wants to follow up with uh, Dr. Elman or uh, Dr. Losey. Please send me a message. Uh, um, but yes, we are just about out of time. Um, I want to just take a moment to thank our amazing uh, speakers for, for sharing uh, their experiences and their knowledge with us this evening, especially Dr. Elman, given um, his, his personal situation. And um, I'm very inspired, actually, by the legacy that his father has left in, in um, really having us all try to get infected with the virus of hope, um, so long as we, we ground that hope in science. And I think that's a beautiful message that he, he's left with all of us and that you shared with us. Um, I wanna thank our, our audience for joining us today and sharing in this positive dialogue about this crisis and, and all the, um, the involvement that you've had, uh, you know, it, seeing people from UTEP and from Burrell, Burrell College, and I know everybody's involved in, in this. Um, I, I do wanna just take one second to let you know that we have started up a committee on PPE and trying to, to source PPE locally for um, many of the populations in our or audiences in our, in our community that don't have ac ready access to PPE or can't buy 5,000 masks at a time so we can do some group purchasing. So you can contact me if you have any um, questions or want to get involved in that effort. We're also trying to start up a private sector-led um, testing option. Um, again, looking to what kind of research we need to do to get reliable cost, um, set, you know, not price gouged testing to our community um, in, in a logical way. So if you want to get involved with those efforts, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I also want to just uh, take a moment to thank all of our first responders, medical providers, public health professionals, and researchers in our community who are helping to work through this crisis, um, and to the general public for abiding by the stay-at-home ordinances. Uh, Dr. Alozi's slides are uh, gave me chills, so we can all be part of the solution if we abide by those things. 
Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you to you all again for your participation. I hope everyone has a very good evening and stays safe. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening.